Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. We are in for a busy weather week, and business could start picking up tonight for a large part of the viewing area that could see some severe weather. Some areas already getting a good downpour today. Meteorologist Sarah Spivey tracking the latest developments and has a quick look at the forecast to kick things off. Sarah. Yeah, Myra, you look out there right now, you see blue skies. You're like, what weather? But it's coming. In fact, we're going to see rounds and rounds of thunderstorms over the next several days. A flash flood watch has been issued until 1 p.m. Thursday, so a good portion of the work week. We could see an additional two to six inches of rain with pockets of six plus inches of rain possible in spots. And here's the weather pattern. A wide view here. You can see that there have been today even rounds and rounds of thunderstorms across uh, the state of Texas. Now these are going to come in waves, and so the timing is going to be difficult to predict. But boy, when you get a thunderstorm through, you're going to have heavy rain, potentially even some severe weather as well. This upper level low is the source of the energy and it's just going to kind of meander over the next few days around the state of Texas. So coming up, I'll walk you through the future cast for tonight. That's when our risk for heavy thunderstorms and severe weather starts. I'll have that update in just a few minutes. Steve. Thank you, Sarah. During the peaks of COVID-19 in San Antonio, all main hospital systems limited visitors to one person during labor and delivery. That one person could not swap out with others at any point. But as positivity rates dropped, local hospital systems have relaxed those guidelines all in different ways. Courtney Friedman breaks down the new rules. Krista Santa Rosa was the first hospital system to change its labor and delivery visitor policy back in March. Two visitors are allowed with the mom at a time. One needs to be the same designated support person, but the other can rotate. Back on April 15th, University Hospital adopted the most lenient local policy. For a non-COVID um, patient, we are back to normal operations. That means you can have two visitors in our labor and delivery. Um, they can switch, but during the delivery, it has to be two individuals who whoever the mom chooses. The biggest difference is postpartum after the baby's born. They can have as many people as they'd like to come and visit at one time. We do allow children to come and visit. Um, so that's new. Baptist made changes less than two weeks ago on May 4th, also allowing two visitors. Those two are going to have uh, wristbands that show that they are the designated visitors. You cannot swap out during that period. Once the baby's born, that main support person stays the same, but the second visitor can swap out. Methodist Hospital remains the most strict. On April 26th, they began allowing the mother to choose two designated visitors, but only one is allowed in with her at a time. So is it this? the seventh second person as we still do not know who's vaccinated who's not vaccinated all these policies are for moms who test negative for covid 19 any positive moms are only still allowed one visitor and that visitor is asked not to leave once they're in the room for the entire stay courtney friedman case at 12 news masks are still mandatory for all local hospitals every hospital except for baptist also continuing to do temperature checks and screenings on everyone who enters the front doors. When you get your COVID-19 vaccination, you're given that little white paper card, but what should you do with that? Well, first it's recommended that you take a digital picture of that card, both the front and the back. The card shows not only which vaccine you got, but the lot number too. The numbers allow manufacturers to track where and when different batches were made to trace and better coordinate a response just in case contamination or other issues are detected. There are some pros and cons to laminating that card. It can protect it, but it could also get smeared. And because you may need boosters later, some suggest putting it in a protective sleeve and storing it with other important papers like birth certificates. You could also carry a copy in your wallet. And if you lose that card, no need to panic. Your first step is to contact the location where you got the shot. They keep a record and file that with the state immunization registry. It knew at six those vaccination cards represent a level of freedom, but not for everyone. Still at risk, even if they're fully vaccinated, are transplant recipients and anyone on medications to keep their immune systems from attacking their bodies. Jesse DeGuiato now with the story of an 84 year old who knows he isn't as well protected as others, but he doesn't regret being vaccinated. Three years after his wife was luckily the perfect living donor for his kidney transplant, Church Watkins has been fully vaccinated against COVID-19, but isn't 
fully protected. 40% or so is better than nothing. Problem being, he says the COVID vaccine is being suppressed by the heavy regimen of anti-rejection drugs he's been on since his transplant. In fact, I take 14 different pills every day to keep the kidney from being rejected. The immune suppression medicines are preventing uh, an immune response that's going to protect all of our folks. Studies, he says, show about half of fully vaccinated transplant patients are not getting the high level of antibodies they need against COVID. How much folks are protected that are not getting those antibodies isn't yet known. So until further study is done, if those recipients are in crowds or among strangers, it's critically important that our folks are double masking and continuing to be uh, socially distant. Watkins certainly will be, especially he says now that there's no guarantee those who aren't vaccinated will wear a mask. Be considerate to those around you who may feel different or may be more vulnerable. Those like Church Watkins with vulnerable immune systems. Jesse DeGollado, KSAT 12 News. Half of the city council district races in San Antonio are headed to runoff elections next month. In District 2 on the city's east side, first-term councilwoman Jada Andrew Sullivan being challenged by a former member of her staff, Jalen McKee Rodriguez. Garrett Berger asked voters what they're looking at to help make up their minds. A dozen candidates are down to just two in the District 2 council race leaving thousands of voters to win over. Christy was the one that I wanted, and so I'm going to have to make a decision between the two, but I will definitely be voting. But municipal elections often have low turnout, and not everyone's eager to go cast a ballot. Because they never do what they say they're going to do. They sit on their butt just like everybody else do and don't do what they say they're going to do. Doris Thompson, skeptical of politicians in general and unsure if she'll cast a ballot. But better infrastructure is what will win her over if she does. If you go down the street, it's just like you're in a roller coaster. You know, and they worked on the street, but that's the way they left it. The it's an issue for Glenn Starnes, too, as is what he sees as a large homeless population. It's just a terrible poverty stricken area, and we're very fortunate that it's being um, uh, regentrified right now. Crime, though, is one of the big issues on Mary Guerrero's mind. Oh, well, there's a lot of shootings around here. I mean, they, they, they killed, a, you know, some of my friends around here. While Omar Rahim Shannon is looking for the right personality. Someone that's a firm believer in God and, and that's a, a, a well-trusted person when you want to speak to about things in order to get things understood. With early voting starting next Monday, it's crunch time for the candidates to win over voters like these. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Time saver traffic right now. Let's go to the Trans Guide camera at 410 in San Pedro. Things moving very smoothly on roadways this afternoon. Well, new at 6, San Antonio ISD teaming up with the Mexican consulate to offer free literacy classes to Spanish speaking adults. The program aims to help parents support their children and make it easier for adults to find jobs. Tiffany Huerta spoke to a parent who says this program couldn't have come at a better time. Yo perdí mi trabajo. Blanca Garcia says she lost her job during the pandemic, but a new program is giving her hope. Me da mucho gusto y, y Blanca says she is thankful for this opportunity to better herself. Blanca joined a group of women at Irving Dual Language Academy this morning for a program that offers free literacy classes to adults in San Antonio. They're going to basically work at their own pace, and it's basically reading and writing. It's literacy. Uh, also math, uh, social sciences. San Antonio ISD partnered with the Mexican consulate. The consulate provides us the training, the resources. At the end of the program, participants will complete an assessment and could earn a certificate from Mexico's public education agency. They are eligible to receive their certificate of completion from the uh, Instituto Nacional de Educación para Adultos. So far, about 25 people have registered. Tengo un niño pequeño y pues, Blanca says sometimes her son has school-related questions. She hopes to learn a lot in this program so she can help her son. The program is free for any adult in San Antonio. There are two different locations and two times a week that this program is available. For all that information, visit KSAT.com. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Look outside with live cam this evening. Some people getting some good rain out yeah. there. And we've got more opportunities on the, the way. The, this was just bright and sunny right. at 5 o'clock. It just shows you 
how fast and sporadic these storms are. And that's going to be the weather pattern over the next few days, but we have a good chance to see there we go. We have a good chance to see thunderstorms tomorrow and especially on Wednesday as well. Tonight, though, we'll see a 60 percent chance for storms around midnight, so it'll be quiet until then in San Antonio. Here's the high rise future cast again. These storms will develop out west. If they have enough oomph, they'll hold on and make it to San Antonio in the pre dawn hours tomorrow. So overnight tonight, the chance to be stormy out to the west. That's where we have the risk for severe weather tonight uh, with potentially hail, but really the biggest issue over the next several days is going to be the possibility for flooding. Here's a look at tomorrow's forecast, a blanketed 60% chance for these waves of thunderstorms, southeast winds at 10 to 20 miles per hour. But as Steve said earlier, we're going to continue to see the rain chances well into the weekend. A look at the future cast for the rest of the week coming up. We are just a few seconds away now from the city and county briefing on COVID in our community, which has largely turned into an update on the vaccination effort in Bear County. Yeah, and we will get an update on those numbers as well as uh, a, a guest that will be joining the judge and the mayor as well. Let's tune in to City Hall. A town hall that's happening here in our community with regard to vaccines, and this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Today's vaccination report, uh, good news again, which shows that 969,499 individuals have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine here in Bear County, and almost 750,000 people now are fully vaccinated. That's 58% of our total Bear, Cap, excuse me, Bear County population that is eligible have received at least one dose and 45% of the population are fully vaccinated. And that's everyone, again, age 12 and up. We have more new good news today. And a total of 696 adolescents aged 12 to 15 received their first Pfizer vaccine at the Alamo this past Friday and Saturday. On Friday, May 14th, 285 adolescents received their first vac vaccine at the Alamo Dome, and 411 were vaccinated on Saturday, May 15th. Thank you to the parents who brought them in. The Pfizer vaccine is the only vaccine approved for 12 to 15 year olds. It's important to note that only locations providing the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, can administer it to 12 to 18 year olds. Consent from a parent or legal guardian is required. Beginning Monday, May 24th, the hours and dates for people to receive the vaccine at the Alamo Dome drive through clinic, either by appointment or walk through or walk in, will change from noon to 8 p.m. Wednesday through Friday. If you prefer to book an appointment, they are also available by booking at covid19.sanantonio.gov or by calling 311. Remember, you can sign up for appointment text alerts by texting COSA, excuse me, by texting vaccine or vacuna to 55000. Let me turn it over to uh, Judge Wolf for a county update. Well, thanks, Mayor. We're certainly headed in the right direction, but we still should be careful. I mean, we still have 170 some odd people in the hospital and 200 and some odd, I think, were uh, just identified as being infected yesterday. So we still need to be careful. We're clearly on the downside and we're working our way out of it. And um, I'm just very, very excited about it. Uh, through our Bear County Hospital District, we've now vaccinated some 435,000 133 people, and most of them being at the uh, Wonderland Mall. L just last week, we did 15,788, of which about 5,458 were first dose. But what's interesting about the first dose, about half of them were, were, were 12 to 16 years old. 2,500 uh, young people came to the uh, 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 Wonderland Mall in this last week and got their uh, got their shots. Um, now next week we're going to be open. We'll continue to open five days a week at the Wonderland Mall, uh, but the hours will be from 11 o'clock to 7 o'clock at night. So what we're finding is that young people coming out is usually between 4 and 7 o'clock. So we'll be staffed up to handle those that will be coming uh, during that heavier period of the time. A uh, little update on the migrant kids that we've been housing out at the Bear County facility uh, for the last 45 days or so. Uh, as you know, we started with 2,100 uh, young uh, boys that were at the, um, at the center, and uh, we're now down to 617 of them. 
and only four of them are in the COVID unit. So uh, things are going well there. We expect that the um, uh, facility will close by the end of the month and the young boys will either be with a sponsor or to another certified uh, uh, outfit that can ha that can handle them. So uh, I just w I want to thank all of the volunteers that have gone out there, uh, particularly Commissioner Rebecca Clay Flores, who, who uh, goes out and volunteers every week, and Catholic Charities and New Star and all the companies that have helped. Uh, you've helped some young boys that were in a very, very difficult situation. Uh, yeah. So thank you all very much for doing that. Great. Thank you, Judge. Uh, community is stepping up for sure. And now for an update on uh, a town hall that's happening at the Muslim Center, let me turn it over to uh, Dr. Osterk, uh, Furhad Osterk, with an update on that. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Judge. It's been my honor and Dr. Uh, to be here. So um, uh, my name is Dr. Ferhat Osterk. I'm from uh, Raindrop Foundation San Antonio. And uh, we are organizing a town hall uh, to give a uh, community update for the Muslim community this Wednesday at 3 p.m. So uh, in this one, uh, we would like to discuss about the COVID-19 vaccine and to provide the Muslim community of San Antonio and Bahar County with some important updates. We are also going to address the COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy in communities of color Answer the, answer the commonly asked questions. So for this uh, town hall, we invited four community leaders uh, from different Muslim organizations, uh, like the MCECC, we have Dr. Shraib Haq, and from the Northside Islamic Center, we have the Imam Abdul Hakim, and uh, we also have from Raindrop Foundation, the board member, Mehmet Ogus, and we also have from the Rahmani Masjid, uh, Javria Ali, so she is a community leader. So in addition to these community leaders, we also uh, recorded uh, community members uh, that they will speak on their own native language. Uh, so we have Turkish, Persian, Arabic, and Urdu uh, speaking community members. So they will be promoting and they're also talking about their experience about their, about their COVID-19 vaccinations. All right, that's so, uh, Dr. Ferret Ozturk giving an update on uh, trying to inform the Muslim community in San Antonio about the importance of vaccines, answer some of the questions there. Uh, the big update from the mayor, we're now 58% of those eligible to get a vaccine have been vaccinated with at least one dose of vaccinations and about 750,000, 45% of our population fully vaccinated. And a quick update on where you can get those vaccines, obviously widely available, but the Alamo Dome site now, the hours are going to change coming up on May 24th, noon to 8 p.m. Wednesday through Friday. Sounds like they're scaling back operations as far as that goes. Wonderland Mall changing its hours from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. So something to note if you still have not yet gotten your shot. All right, want to get quickly to Sarah Spivey, our meteorologist, to talk about the weather situation out there, Sarah, and it ever changing seems yeah. like and, and that's what the weather's going to be like over the last next few days so there are going to be periods of time where it will not be raining but when it does rain and it is going to rain the rain will be heavy and potentially even we could see some severe weather in the form of some quarter sized hail but the biggest thing we're concerned about over the next few days is flash flooding this is a look at the high rise feature cast for tomorrow morning a snapshot of what could be possible right at about four o'clock in the morning and then another round around uh, close to lunch perhaps but again I don't want to focus so much on the timing because that's a little unsure. But what is sure is that we're going to get round and round of round and rounds of rain and thunderstorms. Uh, that'll also continue on Wednesday, as you can see in the high res future cast as well. So it won't be raining all day tomorrow, but when it does rain tomorrow, uh, we'll have to watch out for flooding and we'll keep you informed. And again, it won't be raining all day on Wednesday, but when it does, those showers and storms are going to be heavy. Uh, the potential for flooding a flash flood watch in effect through Thursday at 1 p.m. And as you can see, even after Thursday, we're going to see scattered showers and storms in the forecast. When all is said and done through this weekend, areas around San Antonio and around that I-35 corridor could see up to six inches of rain with pockets of greater than that. So this is why the biggest concern, even though, yes, some marginally severe weather is going to be possible, the biggest concern is flash flooding, which, as you know, here in San Antonio, those 
a typical area is that flood. They flood in pretty big ways. But by the end of the seven days, we're going to be happy to see uh, the rain come to an end by about early next week. I'll tell you what, though, in the summer months, we're going to be wishing for this rain. So this is all in all a good thing, but it can get pretty scary at times. So we'll continue to keep you updated on air, online, and our KSAT Weather Authority app. Yeah, lots to keep tabs on. Thanks, Sarah. All right, of the team still alive, the Spurs certainly have the toughest road. Emphasis on road, Greg. Yeah, and that's a good thing if you're a Spurs fan because I they guess, played yeah. much better this year on the road than they have at home. And the magic number is two. They have to have two wins to get in. When we come back, it is playing time. How does the Spurs stack up against the Memphis Grizzlies, who they've already faced three times this year? We'll show you. And who wants to be the Rambo of football? Coming up. If the Spurs are going to make the playoffs and avoid their second straight season of failing to make the postseason, they will have to win two games on the road in the NBA's new play-in tournament. It's after they lost to the Phoenix Suns in back-to-back -back games at home to finish their regular season at 33-39 and 39, and in the 10th position in the Western Conference. After the Memphis Grizzlies lost to the Golden State Warriors, the Grizzlies dropped to the number nine playoff position and will now host the Spurs on Wednesday with the winner advancing to another playing game and the loser season is over. During the course of the regular season, the Spurs beat the Grizzlies to tip off the COVID-shortened 72 games game schedule on December 23rd in Memphis, 131 to 119, but then lost by double digits in both games at home, falling on February the 1st by 31 points, which is their second worst home loss of the season. The Spurs do have a winning record on the road at 19 and 17, better than at home, which is 14 and 22, a first in franchise history. We've definitely been through a lot as a group, um, as a coaching side, as, a, as an organization, obviously, too. But, um, you know, we're, we're here at the end of the day. Uh, in the 10th spot and, and a chance, um, you know, to, to keep on playing on postseason. All right, here's how the playing tournament works. Eight and seven, the seven Los Angeles Lakers hosting the Golden State Warriors and our San Antonio Spurs at number 10 going to Memphis to take on the Grizzlies. The winner of the Memphis Grizzlies game against the Spurs will play the loser of the Warriors and the Lakers. Tim Duncan was passionate, humble, and funny in his 12-minute acceptance speech when the five-time NBA champion was inducted into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame on Saturday night. His presenter was former teammate Hall of Famer himself, David Robinson, who Duncan team with to win the Spurs franchise's first two NBA titles in 99 and 2003, and then the two that formed the rest of the big three to help win three more titles in 2005, 07, and 2014. Mon Ginobili, Tony Parker. I can't wait to see you guys up here and for me not to be up here. <laughs> uh, it was an honor sharing the court with you guys. Thank you um, for everything. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your brotherhood. Thank you uh, for all the experiences that we shared on that court. Thank you. And just yesterday, the class of 2021 for the Hall of Fame was announced and it includes the late Cotton Fitch Simmons, who coached the Spurs from 1984 to 1986. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law. For the first time since 2019, Cotton Bowl practice, former Penn State linebacker Micah Parsons was back preparing for his first season as a pro. It's after he opted out of the 2020 season, becoming the Dallas Cowboys' first draft pick at number 12 overall. It's been made clear by new defensive coordinator Dan Quinn that Parsons is being groomed for middle linebacker due to the lack of durability from Leighton Vander Esch. What does he think about that? Get to be a Rambo player, uh, get to match on running backs, great chance to play in a box, and I think that's what I do best. If you watch what I did in college, you know, I was able to go sideline to sideline. Uh, this way, it don't let me, let me just be able to hit one side, lets me go both ways, you know, always be around the ball. So, you know, they know that's what I do best, and I'm excited to start there. I have nearly 60 years of calling games that always included the iconic Yes! Marv Albert is retiring at the end of the NBA playoffs. Albert, who turns 80 next month, has covered everything from the Super Bowl to hockey, but is best known for his calls as a play-by-play -play announcer for the Knicks and TNT. Great story to tell. I was in the media room at the Spurs game before game one night. I said, who is calling the game tonight for TNT? And they all said, Marv is. I go, yes! And they just let out a howl. I go, it's not funny. He's standing behind me, isn't yeah. he? He goes, yes! Yeah. <laughs> yes, I am, Gregory. <laughs> That's yeah. nice. Thanks, Greg. You got it. Our case on Q&A is up next. It is a significant historical event that happened after World War I. 
but it wasn't widely publicized or widely even known about until the 1970s. We are talking about the massacre that played out in the city of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, Carrie Lattimore, Professor Carrie Lattimore from Trinity University, history professor, joins us. Uh, always appreciate uh, your input on these kind of uh, events and educate us a little bit. What happened in Tulsa? Tulsa, Oklahoma, the massacre that happened there was perhaps one of the worst, if not the worst, racial incidents of racial violence in American history. Um, over a period of roughly 18 hours, um, a town, an entire community was devastatingly destroyed um, by racial violence. An African-American community in Tulsa that had roughly nine to 10,000 people um, were basically um, wiped out, for lack of a better word, in an 18 hour period of just violence by land and violence by air. Um, there are even reports that airplanes were bombing um, this African-American community. Um, 10,000 people left homeless in the aftermath, um, 6,000 roughly, five, 6,000 sent to um, evacuation centers. Um, and also the people who lived there, their property was looted. This was a very prominent community, perhaps the most prominent African-American community in the nation at that point in time. And you had wealthy people, middle-class people, poorer people, or whatever they had, they were basically reduced to paupers in the aftermath of this evening, this night, this morning of extreme violence. And it's my understanding, and of course we've touched on this, there's a lot that people don't know about what happened uh, during those awful days. We're coming up, we should mention, on the 100 year anniversary of this. But it's my understanding that all of this started because of just speculation, no, no facts, but speculation about what happened between a white woman and a black man. Is that correct? Yes, there was an incident that happened on an elevator. Um, perhaps we think that the African-American man tripped into the elevator, um, but because of that, the news media um, took the story, they elaborated on the story, um, and the man was arrested. Um, a lynch mob started to compile around the jailhouse. The African-American community heard about this. They went to the jail to try to protect the African-American uh, man. Um, the community, you know, the, the, an incident happened there. And after that, as one person said, all hell broke loose. And the white community then went into the African-American community, which is completely separate. Um, the African-American community was separate from the white community, kind of basically by railroad tracks. And so hundreds of thousands, you know, hundreds, perhaps thousands of white men went into this community that day and destroyed the entire community over accusations that were not substantially proven. Hey, Kerry, why wasn't it widely reported? Why was it washed away in the annals of history? I mean, this is something that happened in 1921. It did not become widely reported or even researched that much until the 1970s. I think there are many reasons. For one, I think the African-American community probably didn't want to be reminded of this. And so in their own memories, you have stories that People that went through this situation didn't talk about it. Many left the community, many stayed, but they didn't want to talk about it because it was just too difficult emotionally to handle. I think for the white community, it was difficult to handle as well because how do you deal with the fact that you may have been involved in this? Um, and history is filled with examples of instances of racial violence um, that have gone really untold. Um, and only recently have we started to um, tell those stories, to explore those stories, and to see what messages those stories have for us today. And we are talking about it now, and I think that that's the important part of this conversation, to explore why. What is the significance, obviously, of marking the 100th anniversary of this horrendous event, but why should we continue talking about this when there's been such an effort by so many people years and years ago to essentially make it go away? I think we need to talk about it because it shows the power and the horrific power of mob violence. Um, people, when they get in mobs and groups, they have, they seem to be empowered to do things that they wouldn't do as individuals. Um, as individuals, probably those people who went into that town that evening would not have done that. But as a mob, they did that and they acted in horrific ways. So we always want to remember the power 
and the devastating power that that mob violence has and can do. And when mobs have false information or false pretenses or bad intentions, bad things happen. And I think the second message is that we need to learn from our history. Um, there are so many amazing things of the past that we learn from in good ways, but just as important, we need to learn from the past for the things that happened in the past that were not that good. And so it's important for us to not necessarily wash history away. We cannot do that. Um, authoritarian regimes wash their history or they tell history for their own intentions. Democratic institutions and democratic governments that that uphold democratic principles learn from the history. They learn from the bad things in history and they make them better. And so they, they intend to, that those things never happen again. And so it's a we need to learn from it so that we can become the kind of society that's better, that's more tolerant, that's more understanding, and that's more unified. You're doing a webcast, a live stream on this on Wednesday. If somebody wants to learn more Thursday. about it, Thursday, talk about it where, where people can see it. On Thursday at 6.30, um, it's gonna be on Facebook. Um, we're gonna have uh, exploration of the book um, on the Tulsa race massacre that was written by someone who was actually there at the event and she gives her stories. Um, she writes her stories down. Her great granddaughter, um, Annalisa, Annalisa Brewer, will actually be with us. And Scott Ellsworth, who is probably the preeminent scholar on the Tulsa Race Massacre, will be with us as well. Um, so you can find it on the Trinity website. You can also look the book up on Trinity University Press. And is it on Trinity's Facebook page as well? It should be. Okay. It's been it's been um, promoted very. Um, a lot over the last week. Great, and and I also want to talk about the fact that that I mean, even when you look up, even when you what you call this, uh, you know, it clearly it's a massacre, but yes. it wasn't called that afterwards. It was called a riot instead of a massacre, so people couldn't recover from, couldn't recover insurance payments. I mean, it, 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 there's just so many layers to what has happened, uh, what happened there, and what has happened since. Absolutely. Words matter. And and kind of how we remember things matter as well. So an opportunity to learn more Thursday, the Trinity website, Trinity's Facebook page. Remind us what time again? At 630 Central Standard Time, our time. And you will be moderating. <laughs> All right. So, yes. uh, yeah, a, a fascinating topic. Thank you, Carrie Lattimore, professor of history from uh, Trinity University. Appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. We'll be right back. Here's what could happen when a driverless vehicle meets minor road construction. A Waymo taxi got stuck at an intersection in Chandler, Arizona, confused about orange cones blocking the street. You see the mayor in the distance. Passenger Joel Johnson recorded it from inside this minivan. Waymo says the van detected an unusual situation and requested the attention of a remote fleet response specialist who's watching all this through real time feeds. Yeah, unfortunately, the employee provided incorrect guidance and a roadside assistance team had to be called in to help. Once they arrived, the taxi sped away, then ran into more cones. The roadside crew showed up again. Eventually, the car surrendered to a human driver who was able to complete the trip. Well, there wasn't an accident there. Yeah. Look outside with live cam, some dark clouds, and we're just getting started with this weather, Sarah. Yeah, a couple of folks got to see some rain today, namely the Canyon Lake area, more than an inch of rain. Even here in downtown San Antonio, we saw a good half inch of rain from a shower. But tonight, it'll be fairly quiet until after midnight. That's when we're going to be monitoring for some storms to move into the San Antonio area. That is going to start rounds and rounds of rain, a flash flood watch all the way until Thursday. So for most of this week until 1 p.m. on Thursday for an additional two to six inches of rain, potentially even more pockets of six inches of rain plus. So a lot to cover in the forecast coming up in just a bit. We are just beginning a pretty unusual weather week for you know, us. It just uh, unloaded downtown. And then, oh, yeah. you know, nice and sunny. 
Right, and that's how most folks are ending the day, right, Steve yeah. and Myra, with some sunshine. But things are starting to spice up to the west a little bit. In fact, a new severe thunderstorm watch box issued for these areas like La Prior, Pearsall, Catula, Carrizo Springs, even in Maverick County, but the watch itself is mainly for areas in eastern uh, Maverick County. There is one thunderstorm in Demet County here that is strengthening and could be producing some small hail. Also, some storms off of the Sierra Madres just to the west of Eagle Pass, providing a bit of a light show for those in Eagle Pass looking to the west. Meanwhile, we do have a thunderstorm moving into northern Valverde County. This red box here uh, is for the potential for a, a tornado watch essentially through 11 p.m. But uh, really here in San Antonio, fairly quiet out there right now. A few clouds moving in and temperatures are starting to dip into the 70s. So it's fairly quiet, but we are going to watch those storms developing out west to see just how much oomph they have and whether or not they'll make it to us in the overnight hours. I love this picture of Texas right here because it shows what we're going to be dealing with. Notice how in Texas there have been waves of thunderstorms. Now these waves are pretty difficult to predict as far as timing goes, when we'll see storms, but what we do know for a fact is that we will see storms over the next 48 plus hours. This big upper level low providing the energy and it's going to be again the western counties that will be watching late tonight. This is 1 a.m. to see if these storms actually do strengthen becoming severe with quarter size hail a, a risk, but they'll be close to San Antonio 4 a.m. 6 a.m. time frame. Then we'll be really watching out for the potential for flash flooding because these rains when they happen, they happen uh, in a big way and produce big thick raindrops that lead to uh, flooding issues pretty quickly. But again, tonight's severe weather risk out to the west. We'll keep an eye on that for you. Then um, throughout the day on Tuesday after that morning round of storms, it's entirely possible to see another round of storms around the lunch hour. Again, I don't want you to pay attention to specific timings, just that there's going to be rounds and rounds of rain through Tuesday and through Wednesday as well. And again, wherever those heavy downpours set up, that could lead to flooding issues. Again, look at that massive rainfall potential on Wednesday. So that's why we have this flash flood watch in effect for a long period of time through Thursday at 1 p.m. Widespread uh, two to six inches of rain is possible in places with isolated six inches plus. So even in parts of central Texas, they could be dealing with 10 inches of rainfall. So this is going to be a big, massive rain making system coming our way and producing thunderstorms tomorrow. 60% chance for storms any point during the day. 80 degrees for the high, but we'll really not be paying much attention to temperatures. We'll really just be paying attention to the radar tomorrow. Rain chances spike again on Wednesday, 80% chance for widespread storms, and they even continue past Thursday into the weekend. Scattered showers and storms possible in the forecast, a very busy forecast. We've been encouraging people to download the KSAT Weather Authority app because, as I mentioned, those rounds and rounds of thunderstorms, difficult to predict the timing, but when they happen, you will know. We will give you updates right to your phone and, of course, on air and online as well. Day after day of chances. Thanks, Sarah. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's I See Why Am I. It is Monday. It is May 17th. Texas now opting out of federal unemployment compensation related to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Governor Greg Abbott announcing today the program will end June 26th. That includes those $300 per month unemployment supplement payments. In a news release, Governor Abbott says in part, quote, the Texas economy is booming and employers are hiring in communities throughout the state. He says there are nearly 60% more jobs open and listed in Texas today than there were in February of 2020, the month before the pandemic hit Texas, end quote. A man is in the hospital after San Antonio police say he was shot while walking home. It happened just after midnight in the 15,600 block of Chase Hill Boulevard near La Cantera and 1604. Investigators say the 19 year old victim was walking home from a friend's house when someone shot him in the leg. It was he was taken to the hospital and he is expected to be OK. Today, the Supreme Court agreed to take up a major abortion case in its next term. The case concerns a controversial
federal 2018 Mississippi law that bans most abortions after 15 weeks. That law makes exceptions only for medical emergencies or cases in which there is a severe fetal abnormality. May 31st will mark the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. Now in 1921, a group of white neighbors attacked a neighborhood known as Black Wall Street. 30 blocks of homes and thriving businesses were burned to the ground in just 16 hours. More than 800 people were injured. We do have a couple of severe thunderstorm warnings in the more rural areas around our KSAT 12 viewing area in northern Valverde County. A severe thunderstorm warning for the areas of Pandale and Juneau uh, in effect until 745 for the potential for some quarter sized hail. And then just to the east of Katarina in Demet County, we've got a severe thunderstorm also capable of producing quarter sized hail. But we'll be watching those storms out to the west carefully because the energy with those is what's going to bring us a 60% chance for storms overnight tonight. That'll continue Tuesday and Wednesday with severe storms possible, quarter size hill possible, but really the heavy rainfall is the biggest risk. A flash flood watch in effect for the San Antonio area until 1 p.m. Thursday. And guess what? Our rain chances continue into the weekend as well. All right, you guys are on top of it. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks for watching the news at 6. See you back here on the Night Beat at 10.